Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's great to see you tonight. We have the opportunity as Christians to gather as we have this evening to worship our God. Aren't you glad today that you're a Christian? We're blessed people, aren't we? We have so many things that we could be thankful for, as our brother properly pointed out to us. We learned that uh, this afternoon that Brother Darius Linton was able to watch the live stream this morning for the first time. Of course, he's been in the hospital in Albuquerque, New Mexico for about a month following his accident. But uh, it's a, I know it was a blessing to him, and he appreciated so much the live stream that he was able to see you. And, and I hope he's able to watch tonight. If he is, uh, I just want to say, Darius, that we miss you very much, brother. Our hearts go out to you, our love goes out to you, and our prayers for you go up to God. And let's, uh, let's remember, continue to remember Darius in our prayers in the days ahead. He is very much hoping to leave Albuquerque in the next two days and to come to Herman Memorial Hospital in Houston. We'll say more about that at the close of our service uh, this evening. And I'm looking for my control. Here it is. I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about that flood in southern Louisiana a few weeks ago. It's what was called a thousand-year flood. That is a flood that might come along once in a thousand years. And it's something that that part of Louisiana had never seen. And here's a shot of Gonzales, Louisiana. You can see how, how much they were, were flooded there. And here you see some of the scenes of people who lost virtually everything that they had, had to be rescued. There were just a number of circumstances like this where people had to be rescued from rooftops. Our brother uh, that used to be here, Casey Latcham and his family, Eva and his, his daughter Jessica, uh, they had about six feet of water in their house. Now, they were fortunate in that they had insurance. Most of the brethren over there did not have insurance because it was an area that just never floods. But you can see there was a great deal of flooding there. And a number of people were rescued by boat. Others just walked out through the water and so on. Uh, this fellow here, I don't know whose car that is. Uh, if that's his car, he lost his car, but he saved his goats. He's got about four of them in the boat. And you know that uh, uh, when you get this kind of flooding, that there are some strange and peculiar things that can happen, especially in cemeteries that caskets can come up to the surface and they can float away. Here's someone has tied this casket to a tree so it doesn't get away. Uh, there, in the spite of the flood, there's still a few uh, things that are a, a little bit humorous, and this was one thing that I really liked. It said, don't steal what we have left. God and cameras are watching. And so uh, you see things like that. I want to talk tonight about that, flu about that flood in Louisiana. Uh, this morning I said that we sent $10,000 to help needy Christians there. And someone after service said that Max sure has a lot of money. He sent $10,000. No, it was we. We. The we was a collective we when I say we sent $10,000. It's the Dallin Road Church that sent $10,000 to help needy Christians who were victims of that flood. But we asked the question, why? Why did we assist these Christians? Why did we do that? Well, I suppose there would be an easy answer that says we had compassion. Compassion, we cared about those people who lost everything. And that would be true, of course. And that would tell something about our motivation. But if that's all it was, was compassion, well, then why didn't we send funds to those who were not Christians? I mean, there were lots of those who we would have compassion for. No, it has to be something beyond compassion. It might be further said, well, we sent funds to them because they are Christians. They are our brethren in need, and that's certainly right. But is there something more behind sending that relief? And if it were to be asked, where do we get the authority to take funds out of the church treasury and send to another congregation, to needy brethren, what would we say about that? Someone says, well, we want to be nice to our brethren. Well, it's nice to be nice. That's not authority for a church to do anything. We assisted our brethren in Louisiana because the Scriptures authorized us to do so. That's the answer. 
That's why we sent funds over there. Yes, compassion was part of it. We wanted to help needy brethren, but we assisted our brethren because the scriptures authorized us to do so. And we need to understand, friends, that we can only act in any matter when the scripture authorizes us. And that's true in every case. Everything that we do, we cannot act without authority. And I would point to a number of passages. The first one I would point to is Colossians 3.17. And by the way, if that's the only passage we had, that would be enough. But there are a number of others. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through Him. Notice that phrase, do all in the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus. And to do something in the name of, you understand that. That means to do by the authority of. Uh, when the Queen of England sends an ambassador from London to Washington, he comes in the name of the Queen. What does that mean? Well, he comes carrying the authority of the Queen. When the uh, lawman says, open up in the name of the law, he's talking about the authority of the law. And when we do something in the name of Jesus Christ, we're doing that by His authority. And so passages like Colossians 3.17 require, require, don't suggest, they require that we act by the authority of Jesus Christ. And without the authority of Jesus Christ, we cannot act. The next passage I have up there is 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and in verse number 16, where the apostle said this to the church at Corinth. He said, now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake, that you might learn in us not to think beyond what is written. We're not allowed to go beyond what is written. The old King James Version says that you ought not to think of men beyond that which is written. So the authority of men really doesn't mean anything. The authority of the Word of God means everything. Authorization from God is required in every part of our service to Him. And did you know that even the Jewish leaders under the Old Testament law, they understood that principle? Remember Matthew chapter 21, and I, I want to read a couple of verses from there. That's when Jesus is being grilled by these men. Jesus had, had cleaned up the temple, and He was teaching in the temple. And these Jewish leaders, they're wondering, where did you get your authority? Who gave you a right to do this? This is under the Old Testament law. In Matthew chapter 21 and verse 23, when Jesus came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching. They confronted him. They were confrontational. And they said, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus went on to answer and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. Now, if you know the rest of the context, you know that these men would not answer Jesus. They didn't really believe in the authority of God. But Jesus did. And Jesus did not rebuke these men for asking a question on authority. He treated this as a valid question. And, and I say that only because sometimes people today say, well, we shouldn't ask questions about authority. Uh, that's, that's like legalism. We shouldn't ask a question about where we get our authority. But Colossians 3.17 and 1 Corinthians 4.6 says we should ask questions like that. I'm flipping over to Matthew chapter 15. And in Matthew 15, here's another point of confrontation. In Matthew 15, verse 1, when the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, they said, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For when they... They do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And Jesus answered them and said, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? And when you read the rest of the story here in Matthew chapter 15, what these fellows were doing, they were taking some of the commandments of God and setting them aside. Even one of the Ten Commandments that said, You shall honor your father and mother. They had a scheme to get around that. And so here's God's commandments. They're set aside. But now we're going to put our own commandments in about washing your hands before you eat. This is a command of God, they said, and it wasn't, but they treated it as though it was. You see, Jesus addressed this issue of authority, that these men were not respecting the authority of God in what they were doing. And so you, you find this 
all over the Bible, the idea of respecting God's authority. Back in the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, the opening verses of chapter 4, listen to what it says here. And this is, of course, when the law of Moses was given. It says, Now, O Israel, Deuteronomy 4, 1, Now, O Israel, listen to these statutes and judgments which I teach you to observe. Now, why should they listen? Because they came from God. The Word of God came from God. It's not the Word of men. And so he says, listen to these statutes and judgments, which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not, watch this, this is verse 2, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor shall you take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So here, even under the law of Moses, they weren't allowed to add to or take away from the Word of God. What that means is they were, they were obligated to follow the authority of God's Word without changing it. So we can't say that we sent funds to our brethren in Louisiana just because we are compassionate. And, and we can't say we sent money to them because we want to be nice. And we can't say that we just sent money to them because they are our brethren. And when I'm using the word we, I'm using the collective we, talking about this collectivity, this congregation. What we have to have is authority from God's word, something in the word of God that authorizes us to act in such cases. So again, where do we find our scriptural authority for a church, for our congregation, to send funds to a church over there, which is what we did, to help those needy Christians who were flooded out. Where do we find our authority? Well, Scripture authorizes, and we're going to look at some specific passages. Scripture authorizes church benevolence. By church benevolence, I mean money out of the church treasury. Scripture authorizes church benevolence to needy saints. It authorizes it in cases within a congregation. The Scripture also authorizes us to send money to saints in another place, which is what that case in Louisiana was. Scripture, and I want to say this, Scripture only authorizes that. It doesn't authorize us to just send funds to anyone and everyone. It's about Christians. And let me show you some passages. And the most obvious passage on this is one that we're very familiar with, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 4. We often quote this passage but we rarely discuss the context of it. In the context of it, it's talking about the needy saints in the city of Jerusalem and how that Paul had directed a number of churches to assist those needy saints. And notice how it's worded. Now concerning the collection for the saints. The collection, the immediate context here, was a collection that was going to assist the needy saints. It was for the saints. Now sometimes... We misquote this verse, not, not intending to, but now concerning the collection of the saints. That is, we're taking a collection of, from the saints. Well, that's true, but that's not what the verse said. It is a collection for these saints. As I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also on the first day of the week. Let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. So this is to help the Jerusalem saints. It's very, very specific. Now someone says, well, do we have other passages that authorize a collection? We have numerous passages that authorize that, that authorize us to do all the work of the church. Uh, the support of preachers in this place, the support of preachers in other places, uh, all the things that we need to do in order to function as a congregation. We've got plenty of other passages. It's just that this one is specific about when a collection is to be done. It's to be done on the first day of the week. And in the context, notice that it was a collection for the saints. It was needy saints who were being assisted. Now I'm going to the next book, the 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I want to see two verses there, one from verse number 4, uh, chapter, chapter 8, verse number 4, and then chapter 9, verse 1. And as I'm looking at those passages, I would say this to you, that Paul is addressing the very same issue as he just addressed 
in 1 Corinthians 16. This collection was being made up, and here now, several months later, Paul was coming to pick this collection up. He and uh, probably five or six or seven other men, it, it appears, were going to carry this collection to Jerusalem to relieve the needs of the saints there. But what we have here is chapter 8 and chapter 9, these two consecutive chapters, which address this issue in some detail. But notice again who the collection is being made for. I'm looking at verse 4 as he talks about, this is chapter 8, verse 4, Paul is talking about the Macedonian Christians and using them as an example to motivate the Corinthians and how the Macedonian Christians, they were poor, but they still wanted to help. You know, one of the things you learn about God's people, God's faithful people have always been generous in giving. You remember in the Old Testament when uh, uh, they just crossed the promised land, uh, or they crossed the, the river and they were going to come to the promised land as the people were being delivered from bondage and Moses said, we've got to take up a collection here for all the stuff we need to build the tabernacle and to support the priesthood. And what happened? There was so much given that everybody said, stop, stop. We're getting too much. And that's the way God's faithful people have always been. And so here you've got a, some, poor, some poor Christians in Macedonia who want to help those in Jerusalem who are even poorer. And they, it says in verse 4, they implored us with much urgency. They're saying, you've got to help, you've got to let us help you. And these are poor people saying this, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. This gift, this money that was being taken up was for the ministering to the saints. Chapter 9, verse 1, he continues. Both chapters are all about this. Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. And he goes on and talks about the willingness of the Corinthians to make this contribution. So you've got two whole chapters which address the ministering to the saints. The same issue is found over in the book of Romans. I'm looking in Romans chapter 15. In Romans chapter 15 and verses 25 and 26. And once again, he's still talking about the very same collection that he was talking about in 1 Corinthians 16. And, and Paul now is on his way. He's going to Rome. Uh, I'm sorry, he's going to Jerusalem, but he's writing to the Roman Christians. And he says this in 1525 of Romans. Now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. It's, it's, and of course, the word saints there is not talking about the common use of saint today, which applies to someone who's dead and uh, someone that's been voted on by a bunch of uh, church leaders. No, the, 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 the saints is just a reference to God's people, those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. So don't misunderstand that. I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints for it pleased those from Macedonia, same group that we just talked about, and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And when he says poor among the saints, it wasn't for everybody. It wasn't that they're going to take this money to Jerusalem and the money's just going to be distributed equally to everybody. It is the poor among the saints. Another case is found in the book of Acts, and you're familiar with this. In Acts chapter 6, when there was a controversy in the church about some of the widows who were not being properly supported, in Acts chapter 6 and beginning at verse number 1, it says, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. And that's when they chose seven men to take care of this need. But this was within the church. You've got one group of widows who are being taken care of, the other group of widows who are not being taken care of. And so once again, we have authority to take care of the needy. And then one other passage I would mention, and there's, there are a few more, I suppose, but 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 16 is a passage that, again, specifies the idea of helping those who are saints. It says in 1, 1 Timothy chapter 5, and you need to read the whole chapter to get the context here, but it says, If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them, and do not let the church be burdened, that it may relieve those who are really widows. And so the church can take care of those in its number who are widows who are destitute. 
And it's really the same thing that we just saw back in Acts chapter 6. So acts of benevolent assistance from the church treasury, acts of benevolent assistance, is always directed at saints. And here we have these many passages and others which authorize church benevolence to saints. But I want to bring one more passage. I want to bring one more passage forward for your consideration. And that's Acts chapter 11, verses 27 to 30. Here we have a different contribution. These several, some, several of those that we've just seen were, were about this problem in Jerusalem. But here, at an earlier time in Acts chapter 11, this is, this is some years earlier, and we don't know exactly how many, but in Acts chapter 11, and beginning at verse 27, it just says, in those days... Prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world which happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, this is at Antioch, okay? Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And here this shows how relief was sent to brethren in need in another place. Prophets of God came from the church in Jerusalem to the church in Antioch. And one of these men, he's of course a prophet, is God's spokesman. This man's name is, is Agabus. And he told of an impending famine that was going to impact the whole world. And the implication here is that the churches of Judea would be particularly hard hit by this. I mean, if, if it was going to be a famine that would be equal in every place, while the whole world might be impacted, it's not going to be equal in every place. If it was, you wouldn't have one church sending to another church. If the brethren here are hit hard by the famine, they're not going to be sending funds to help another church. So implied is that the churches of Judea would be particularly hard hit by this famine. Now the church, the disciples here in Antioch, they determined that they would send relief to the brethren in the churches of Judea. Now, this was a group effort because it says all the disciples in Antioch took part. They gathered their money together, and from this church in Antioch, they sent the relief, they sent the relief to the church churches, actually plural, churches in Judea by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul served then as messengers of the church in Antioch. And it says here that the funds were delivered to the elders of the churches in Judea in order to be distributed to the brethren who were hurt by the famine. Now, in the recent episode concerning our brethren in Louisiana who were hit by the great flood, the Dallin Road Church acted by the authority of this text and others in sending relief to the brethren in Gonzales, Louisiana. The $10,000 that we sent came from the church treasury, funds that had been collected on the first day of the week contributions from the Christians here. And that money was sent directly to the elders of the church in Gonzales, and it was sent to them so that they might distribute to the brethren who were in need. And we received a letter this week, and Chuck Frege gave me this this morning, and this is a letter now that is being circulated all over the country. Did you realize that the brethren in Louisiana believed that they needed about $500,000, about a half a million dollars to meet the needs of those brethren who had been wiped out? And did you know that they received way more than that? And now the elders in, in Gonzales, Louisiana are saying, please don't send any more money. Kind of like that circumstance back in the book of Exodus when there was too much money being given. In fact, they find themselves in a situation where they're going to have to return uh, some of the money because it is more than they need. And uh, I'll share this letter with you. I'll leave it up here if anyone would like to take a look at it. But I just think it's an interesting thing that God's faithful people are very generous. And what we see, what we see here in Acts chapter 11 is fundamentally what we did here at Dallin Road. We sent a substantial amount of money to assist those brethren. But others did the same thing. And that's the same thing that you see in 1 Corinthians 16. Paul said, I'm giving order to the churches of Galatia to do this as well as to you. 
And so there were a number of congregations that were sending funds directly to those in need. So the model that we see in Acts chapter 11, verses 27 to 30, authorizes us by an approved apostolic example, compassion for our brethren, that was our motive. But our authority was the word of God. Can you distinguish between that, between motive and authority? We wanted to help them. We were concerned about them. These were people who essentially lost everything. And so compassion was our motive, but our authority was the word of God. The Word of God was and is our authority. And let me conclude with this final point, that what is true in benevolence is true in all that we do, that we operate by the authority of the Scripture. Sometimes brethren in other churches, they will argue that we can do whatever we want and we don't need scriptural authority for all that we do. And sometimes you'll find brethren that just come out and say that. They may even say of themselves, of their church, oh, we do many things without authority. And I tend to agree with them. They, not Dallin Road, they do many things without authority because they have thrown the idea of authority to the wind. We can do whatever we want. We have liberty. We have freedom. We'll do whatever we choose with the Lord's money. We can't do that, brethren. What we did in relieving the saints in Louisiana was done by the authority of the Scriptures. We had authorization from the Scriptures. And you remember earlier this year, we took up a special collection for the brethren in Africa. They're facing this terrible drought and just received a note this week that the brethren right now that we support through Brother Warren Skoltz, they are good to the end of the year. And that's just more good news. But we collected on a given Sunday, we took up a collection of $42,000 and we said that everything over our normal amount, which is 14000 a week, everything over that would go to help the brethren in Africa. So $28,000 from that Sunday alone was set aside to assist our brethren in Africa. We've also taken up special collections for brethren in, in Mexico and in the Philippines at various times. But what we do on these things, we operate by the authority of the Scriptures. And while there are many verses on this principle that we could call to attention. We only need the one, Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we're going to operate by the authority of Jesus, by God's authority, and when we have a passage that authorizes us, as these many passages do, and there are more, these passages authorize us to take funds from the church treasury and to send to brethren in need in other places. And so, that's why we always look for commands and direct statements in the New Testament before we act. That's why we look for apostolic examples, approved examples in the New Testament, and we carefully research the implication of New Testament scriptures before we act. And we do that, friends, we do that on everything. It, it's not just in benevolent issues. We can never act upon our own authority. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, that you should not think of men above that which is written. And so when we talk about our work that we do, our worship, our organization, our doctrine, anything and everything that we do, we have to have authority. Remember Colossians 3.17 says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all, whatever you do in all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we operate by his authority and not by ours. And let no one be deceived on that. The Dallin Road Church always operates by the authority of the Word of God on every matter. And if we choose not to, if this congregation chooses not to operate by the authority of the Word of God, then our very integrity as a faithful congregation belonging to Jesus Christ is undermined. Our integrity as a faithful New Testament church hinges upon us operating only by the authority of Christ. And so we have to have authority for all, all, everything, all that we do. And we dare not go beyond the Lord's authority in any matter, not in anything. Now someone says, well, where do you get authority for electric lights? And where do you get authority for a data projector? Well, we have taught classes on authority, 
and we demonstrate in those classes how we do that. And if you'd like to have more studies on authority, we would be most happy to answer any and all specific questions because there are people all over that say, oh, churches of Christ do many things without authority. Well, I agree with them. Many of them do, but we don't. We operate by the authority of the Word of God. And let me just say this as a final note. God's authority is not just about the operation of the church and how we use our funds. God's authority extends even to salvation. Jesus Christ has given us a plan of salvation, and we teach that plan, and we operate by that plan. And you've heard David, you've heard Ben, you've heard Max, you've heard Chris, and dozens of other teachers teach the plan of salvation, that we must hear the gospel, believe in Jesus as the Son of God, believe the gospel, repent of sins, confess Jesus as God's Son, and be baptized into Christ, rise to walk in newness of life, and be faithful to the Lord. You've heard that taught a hundred times. Maybe you've heard it a thousand times if you've been around long enough. All of that by the authority of Jesus because those are the things that we find in the Word of God. Now, I'm closing with that point simply to say this, that there might be someone here tonight that says, I have never submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ in respect to salvation. And tonight I am ready. I'm going to change my life by the power of Christ. I will turn from sin. I will confess his wonderful and worthy name, and I will be baptized into Jesus tonight. Submitting to his authority. He becomes Lord, you're not. He becomes king, and you are his kingdom citizen. If you're ready to do that tonight, it is Jesus who invites you to come as we stand and sing. Come now, please.